Hi, everyone, and welcome to The Miracle Show. I'm your host, Kevin Sizemore. This is a show about hope and optimism. Before we get too far, meet my co-host. My name is Gunnar Sizemore, and my dad has been stuck in the basement for way too long. <laughs> That's funny. Well, uh, what, what he meant to say is that we found this TV in the basement. Yeah, we fixed this bad boy up and found out that it tells stories, but not just any stories. These are stories about perseverance and compassion, and they might help you feel a bit of optimism. So without further ado, why don't we start meeting our guest? Um, so, uh, imagine you're going out for a, a walk in nature and all of a sudden you see this cute little cub. What do you want to do? You want to go pet it. But it's a mountain lion cub and where there's a mountain lion cub mean there's a mama. And this is the situation that Kyle Bird just found himself in very recently. So in a moment, we're going to go moment by moment with Kyle and figure out what happened with this mama mountain lion. No, 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 no in a moment. We're gonna do it now. Let's go to Utah and let's meet Kyle. Hey, Kyle. Hey, Kevin, it's Kyle. I'm so happy to be on the show today. It's so nice to meet you, man. Can you tell us about the day leading up to the hike? Okay. Yeah, so before the hike, I got off my job at UPS and me and my wife usually go out like for lunch and I decided that I would go on a hike later that day. I uh, got my running shoes on, got everything ready, kind of went to the trailhead. Probably about halfway through is kind of when I ran into some wildlife. And what happened when you saw those cubs in your path up ahead? I originally thought they were bobcats, just because I have seen bobcats before. And normally most wildlife, for me, runs off once they see a human. I need to go that way anyway. I'll t take some cool video of whatever this is. And as you get closer, it dawns on you that these aren't bobcats. Once I kind of realized they were not bobcats, it was already too late. And before we finish Kyle's story, we'd like to bring on Denise Peterson. Denise is a GIS analyst for the Mountain Lion Foundation. Do you mind telling me what the Mountain Lion Foundation is? So the Mountain Lion Foundation is an organization whose mission is to ensure that mountain lions in America thrive and survive in the wild. Our focus is primarily on education, outreach, and helping to inform policy decisions with the best available science. Sounds like a pretty cool job, Denise. What do you do there? So I wear a lot of different hats with the Mount Lion Foundation. I'm one of their Western region coordinators, so I oversee eight different states. We do a lot of work with policy in each of these different states too, so I keep an eye on that. If situations arise with an encounter, I deal with that. Well, okay, okay, back up. What is a GIS analyst? And GIS is Geographic Information Systems, which is a way of processing and mapping data. Awesome, sounds like you're exactly the person we need to be talking to. So I've been told that you not only study Kyle's footage, but you've also met him and you retraced his steps. I did, we had a really good hike up the mountain and uh, he actually took us to the place where the encounter happened and gave us the rundown. Perfect, let's roll the tape. So, Kyle, that's a mountain lion, right? But you think it's a bobcat, until... Cause she darted right at me and she kind of made that growl like... And it was very, very intimidating, wow. There is a, a mama cougar that doesn't want me next to her kids, and she's not happy with me. Go away! Whoa. No. That is kind of when I took my steps, a few steps back, keeping my eyes on her, kind of knowing where she was, uh, not turning around and running. Kind of felt no. like she was trying to flank me no. and come up behind me. And so I didn't Go want away. that to happen. She kept doing her little pounces, knowing no. That if, if she pounced, no I kept moving back. And no that's kind of when I also noticed as well, every time I took my eyes off her, or even bent down just the slightest and made myself look a little bit smaller, she would pounce at me because she kind of felt like I was vulnerable and I was weak at that point in time. So, so Denise, what is she actually doing here? Is she stalking? That's Whoa. not stalking behavior in any way, shape, and form. So mountain lions are ambush predators that rely on concealment or cover from their Ooh. environment. So their goal, because they're not long distance runners, is to get as close as they can 
without being teacher. seen oh. until they can pounce on their prey. So, if it had been stalking behavior, Kyle wouldn't have known that she Go was away. there. It was very clearly defensive behavior. Mama Lion didn't see food. She saw a threat to her offspring, so she just wanted to get him out of the area so she could go back to her babies and move on to a safer place. No, go away! Go away! Whoa, 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 whoa. No. Oh, whoa. <laughs> so when she started pouncing at me, I didn't know if she was either trying to jump at me or if she just wanted me to back up. And that's why, honestly, I just kept backing up as much as I did without trying to make her more angry at me than she already was. I just continued to back up, hoping that she wouldn't come closer to me because I was obviously pretty darn scared. She actually turned sideways a couple of times and her goal was to make herself look big, make herself look more threatening, but not necessarily to attack. You could tell that she was just, she saw this person, this individual coming down the trail, approaching her cubs, and to her okay. this was a threat to their well-being. Now Kyle, why didn't you just run away? <laughs> yeah. Because mountain lions are predator animals and that would trigger that instinct and we would become the prey. I knew if I ran, I would then become a kitty meal that day. <laughs> I'm not laughing at you, man. I'm actually laughing with you. It's some scary stuff there. I'm just glad you're okay. I don't know if I would have done that, but did Kyle do the right thing? If you start fleeing, you're perceived or can be perceived as prey. Another thing that he did that was really well done was that he didn't turn his back to the cat. He maintained eye contact. He continued to face her. So that way it didn't expose vulnerability. It didn't, again, seem like a prey type of behavior. So that was another thing that he did really well. He also yelled and kept talking to the cat. That's something that a deer or an elk won't do. That, that behavior says, look, I'm human. I understand what's going on. I'm talking to her, hopefully just calling myself down, letting her know that I'm there. And at the same time, I'm thinking, wow, this is going on for a very long time. One hand Where's had my babies? phone in it, videoing, and then I had my other hand up in the air to the side of me, and as well as kind of making my shoulders look a little bit broader, yelling so that I sound really big, and so that I sound scary. So eventually, I was able to get a good distance between me and the mama cougar, when I felt like it was okay for me to grab a rock, even if she did lunge at me or pounce at me, I should have had enough time to grab the rock, get back up and toss the rock. And which I did. I was able to get down, lean to the left of me, grab a big rock, it's probably about five, seven pounds, toss it in her direction and it hit the ground next to her and it startled her enough that she yet ran off. Kyle, that's some incredible stuff. What happened after you turned off the video? I was so relieved that she ran off. And I was also, there's just so much adrenaline kind of pumping through me at that time. Yeah, so that just happened. Wow. Do you see, see that? Oh, I'm somewhat calm, actually. Holy cow. Holy cow. Yeah, it, it was so like that unreal that I almost didn't think even happened. It almost felt like a dream. And you said you still had to go back down that trail in the direction of the mountain lion to get out of the park? No, 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 no. Mm -mm, mm -mm. So on my way back down, uh, I had a stick in my left hand and a rock in my other, waiting for something else to come at me or even the mama cooter to come back at me. The relieving part was probably around 50 yards in, there was two hikers that came up the trail and I stopped them really quick. I was like, whoa, like, wait a second. Did you, did you see the mama cougar and her cubs? And they kind of played it off like I was joking to them. But I showed them the video on my phone. I was like, no, like, and they were just as surprised as everybody else was when they saw them in my video. But that gave me more relief because they just came up the canyon where the cougar was. And I only had about two miles back to the trailhead to where my car was. I bet that was a big relief when you finally made it to your car. 
Now, how scared were you the whole time? Did you think you weren't gonna make it? There's definitely a point where I thought that I was gonna get hurt. I don't think it came to my head that I was going to die, but I really, it really came to that, oh, I might come out of this with some missing limbs, possibly. Okay, Denise, if the mountain lion would have pounced on Kyle, which I'm glad he didn't, but if he did, what should he have done? One of the things to remember is if a mountain lion does attack, fight back because they're conflict averse animals and if they perceive risk to themselves, they're gonna take off. Because again, a deer's not really going to fight back all that much. Uh, prey typically does not fight back all that much. So if you fight back, there's a really good chance that the lion will flee the scene. Dad, yeah, we're never going hiking again. Never. Now that we've scared all of our viewers from ever going out to the great outdoors, tell us what's the actual likelihood that anyone who's out there hiking would end up in Kyle's situation. They're really quite secretive and to get eyes on a mountain lion in the wild is incredibly rare. I've been tracking them for years and I've still not seen one in the wild. So it's rare. Ha, ah, thank you. See, not that common. Guess not. Anyway, Denise, if you do see one, how do you recognize it as a mountain lion? So a mountain lion typically is tan or tawny in color throughout most of its body. The underbelly fur will be sometimes a little bit lighter. And they have rounded ears that are black on the back with light white undertones. And then they have a unique distinguishing mustache on their face uh, with a little bit of white intermixed. And then they have really long tails with a brown tip at the end. I think if you live in mountain lion country or any wild animal country, it's important to understand what to do if there's a conflict. And what's that? Don't run, don't turn your back, maintain eye contact, make yourself look big, yell, throw things, because I've generally got water bottles or backpacks or trekking poles or something that I can throw at the animal. Because again, you don't want to crouch down. We always think it's not going to happen to us running into these animals, but I thought of that and I, they happened to me. And so it's just being aware of your surroundings and also, yeah, being prepared for what could happen. Understand your environment, know who's out there and what to do if and when you see them because you never know. You know, every, every wild animal is an individual. They behave differently, so you, you don't know how that animal's going to respond. In, in Kyle's situation, he came across this lion on a trail that he'd run time and time and time again. But that day, the stars aligned and their paths crossed. Kyle, it was great to meet you. Thank you for sharing your story with us. And Denise, thank you for being here also and sharing your knowledge about these incredible animals. Kevin, it was a pleasure talking to you today. And if your viewers want any more information, I encourage them to visit mountainlion.org. Wow, that was pretty cool, huh? I remember seeing that video when it went viral a few months back. It was amazing to see what family does to protect each other. And our next guest, Elva Cassiano, had something called preeclampsia. So why don't we go to Massachusetts right now and meet with Elva. Hey Elva, welcome to the show. Hi Kevin, it's Elva. I'm really happy to join you today. And we're so pleased to have you, Elva. Can you tell us a story of the events leading up to that Thanksgiving? Actually, I was very sick. I wasn't really, you know, myself. I had lost a lot of weight. The medication they gave me to see if it can boost my energy. I had no energy at all, but none of that that they tried worked. So I went to see a nephrologist. He said, your kidneys are failing. So that's when they decided you need dialysis. At this time, Elva's son David was giving her rides to the dialysis center. This, of course, had a profound effect on David. And to continue Elva's story is her son, David Hernandez. Hello, David. Hey, Kevin. So, David, as the holidays were approaching, what kind of shape was your mother in? At the time, her kidney was at 10%, I believe. Um, and that's it's not very much <laughs> for, for someone's kidney to 
be, you know, be living. I was kind of shocked because, you know, before she ever announced that she had kidney disease, she was perfectly fine. She was working, she was doing normal activities, you know? Yeah, I totally understand how concerned you were. So, everything was normal up until then. Elva, tell us what dialysis was like. I went to dialysis three times a week. I sat there for three hours. The medicine was inserted for three hours, you know, changing, you know, cleaning the blood. So that for me was very scary. You know, fainting and having them give me more blood so I can, they can balance it out. I was very sick. I passed out multiple times. And at that time, she mentioned, well, were you, were you gonna be on dialysis for quite some time. It, it hurt because I didn't want her to go through any type of, you know, pain or suffering, you know? And that's when they started the process of putting me on the, on the list. And they said they're not gonna lie. It takes about five years. Um, I had to take that in. I told my family I didn't want a kidney from my family members. I, I repeatedly told them I, I wanted to remain on the on list. Wow, okay. So you're on dialysis and your kidneys are getting weaker. What happened after that? Actually, I didn't know anything. They were all tested family members, friends, they were all tested. Uh, I had no clue. My youngest brother didn't. I didn't want him to get tested and no one else wanted him to get tested because he's the youngest. Um, but my three oldest, they, they did and they were a match, but they also had health complications themselves. I didn't want them to have one kidney and I didn't want them, you know, if. God forbid something would happen to them. They'll have one kidney. So David, now your mom's been put on the waiting list managed by the United Network of Organ Sharing. And of course, they're gonna give priority to the people that have been on the list the longest. So tell us what happened next. Um, imagining a world where I lost my mother. It, it's not a world that I want to live in. So, if I am given the chance to give her a longer life, I'll take that chance, no matter what. Why make her wait when I have a healthy kidney that I could give her? Since this was right around the holidays, what was your reaction when you found out you were a match? When I found out I was a match, I, I wanted it to be a surprise for her. I just couldn't see her suffer anymore, and that's what I told myself. So I figured, why not surprise her on a day where she's gonna be surrounded by family and loved ones? There was a, a big family gathering on Thanksgiving Day. This was on 2017. I made her believe that she had a letter from from somewhere that she had to sign immediately. My son gave me a letter and um, he said, Mom, I need you to read this letter for me. My brother, my oldest brother, he gave her the, the letter. She opened it and there was a paper inside. As I'm looking at her open, open the, uh, the letter, my heart is immediately pumping so fast um, because I didn't know how she was going to react. It had a picture of just a random kidney and it had said, this is David's kidney and he's going to give it to you. So I cried <laughs> and I said, why are you doing this? And um, he, answer he answered to me, Mom, because I love you. Mom, because I want you with us. And I want to give you a kidney. She immediately looked at me and 
started bawling her eyes out and uh, the the feeling was just they were so happy my children everybody was ecstatic um there was a lot of crying there was a lot of laughter it was beautiful it was the most beautiful thanksgiving i ever had had a hat in my whole entire life. Your son gives you this gift, the gift of life. But now we have another problem. You have to wait for the transplant operation. Um, the operation day, um, it was me and my son. We, we were together at that time. Going into the operation, um, it was very scary. I immediately thought, like, is she going to be OK? Is she going to is she going to live through it? We were, and then we were separated in different operation rooms. I had so many emotions going through. I was I was frightened. I was happy. I was. I was excited. At that time, I was nervous. But then again, I was I was happy. I didn't know what to expect. Is it is it gonna be you know? Oh, is it gonna be you know? Am I gonna make it? And I was saying to myself, if it's it's something gonna happen, you know. I was worried about him, and I was worried about myself. It was just very frightening. I'm looking back at it. Uh, you have all these doctors surrounding you, and and you don't know where your mom is and you don't know how you're going to feel after, you know, post-surgery, there was also a small percentage of chance that my mom's body could deny the kidney and it can be, the situation could be worse for her. I just had my mom in the back of my head and that's what gave me the courage to go through with it. So coming out of the surgery, all I wanted to know was, is my mom okay? Did she, did her body accept the kidney, you know? And when they, when the nurses told me that the kidney was, was working fine and it was, it was pumping on its own and her body accepted it, that feeling of Gratitude. I was, I was so thankful. I was so happy. Um, I knew that she was going to be okay. The doctors, they're amazed. Because they say the kidney feels like it, it was for you. It just pumped by itself. As soon as I could uh, start walking, I, I immediately wanted to go to my mom's room to see her. I was ecstatically happy knowing that he was doing so good. Um, like the next, the, 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 that day, he started walking the same day of the operation. I mean, I couldn't walk, but he did. When I left, I, I knew I was leaving my mom in good hands. Um, but going home, it was difficult because the pain was just, it, it's in my core area. And so having pain in the core area, it's not fun at all because the core is, you know, you move like one, one subtle movement and you have pain. Recovering from the operation, it was painful. Uh, I got a lot of support from my family. I got a lot of support in the hospital. They were wonderful. And what has it meant for you to have this renewed lease on life? My life changed extremely. I feel good. Um, I feel healthy. I get to look forward to so many things. I get forward to knowing that I can see my grandchildren grow. 
I get forward to birthday parties for my grandchildren. And to me, that is special. That is so special for me. So Elva, I know your son scored some points here with you. So all these years later, how do you feel about the sacrifice David made for you? David for me, uh, he's so special. Since he was a young boy, I knew, I knew he was very special. It's the most loving thing that God gave me in earth. Elva, sorry, I've asked you a lot of questions, but I have another one for you. What advice would you give to other people who've been in your situation? I mean, I would imagine it's hard to ask that much of a loved one. My advice is um, if you're going through my situation and, um, and you have a family member, a friend, it's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. Not, and don't be afraid. If my son wouldn't have given me the kidney, I would have end up in the hospital struggling to get a kidney. Thank God my, my son came to the rescue. <laughs> Elva and David, thank you so much for sharing your amazing story with us. Kevin, I love the show and I'm so happy to be in the show today. Wow, what an amazing story. Good health is truly a blessing. You're right, and the hardest part of good health is staying motivated. It's not always easy to make the time to exercise. Well, let alone when the weather turns dreary and cold and you've been outside working all day. But Timothy Boyle found an inventive way to overcome that challenge. Instead of only thinking about himself, Tim decided to treat his journey to health as an opportunity to give back. And here now is Timothy Boyle from his home in North Dakota. Hey, Timothy. Hey, Kevin. I'm Tim. It is fantastic to meet you. Great show. Thank you, Tim. So take us back. When did you get your start running? It's funny because I, I never thought that I would ever become a runner. Um, as a matter of fact, if nine years ago you would have told me that I would have been a runner, I would have laughed at you and probably pushed you over in a snowbank or whatever. I was a two and a half pack a day smoker and I had given that up and instead of putting a cigarette in my mouth, I was putting food in my mouth. I took one bad habit and exchanged it for another. And so that's how I ended up becoming a runner is I needed to take some of that weight off because it was becoming unhealthy. I heard you were going through a lot at the time. So I was going through a pretty tough time. I was going through a divorce. I was in the whole woe is me, poor, poor, pitiful me, you know, you know, just, just feeling sorry for myself. And I had a friend of mine whose aunt was one of the uh, board members of an organization that deals with people with Down syndrome. And so I, I kind of got addicted to that page and I was going through there and that's how I found Michael. Right, and that's Michael Wasserman. Tell us about him. Michael is a 58 year old man. Uh, he's got Down syndrome and he's confined to a wheelchair because of bilateral hip dysplasia. He is one of those guys that he's electric. You, you're just drawn to him automatically. And the fact that he was doing these paintings and uh, auctioning them off for charity just led me to, like, I, I was drawn to him instantly. And so that's what I did was I, I bid on his paintings and that's, that's how he and I became friends. And besides being drawn to his paintings, you and Michael shared another common interest. Years ago, he would compete in the Special Olympics and his specialty was the 50 yard dash. Um, so he was a runner back in his day um, until uh, the hip dysplasia had caused him to not be able to run anymore. Uh, he did do, at that time, it was a very, very experimental surgery. And if I remember correctly, he was able to run again for a little while. Um, and eventually the, the surgery had deteriorated to the point where he ended up back in the wheelchair. And so that's that's michael like he he is a bright 
bright bulb in this world. He is a light. Sounds like you two have a powerful bond. When did this carry into your running? I started Googling uh, inspirational quotes and I found one that said, I run because I can and when I get tired, I remember those who can't run and what they would give for this simple gift that I take for granted. And I thought, man, this is profound. I was like, I am, I'm gonna post this on Facebook because I know other people are gonna be like, whoa, that is so cool. And, and so I did, I posted that on Facebook and he saw the post and he said, you can run for me anytime. You weren't done yet though. How did this lead to your organization? I was doing a 5K in the middle of winter here in North Dakota, which is six below zero. And my best friend at the time, she, she had voluntold me that I was running this race and that was gonna be really, really cold. And so um, I started training and uh, that's when I started running for Michael. And I told her about it, I was like, you know, Carrie, I'm running this race for Michael and she, and she goes, we're going on the radio because she was the program director of the local Christian station. I'm like, okay, that's fine, we, we can do that. And we went on and it was right before we were going on air, um, I asked her, I said, do you think other people are gonna wanna do it? I guarantee you, people are gonna buy into it, people are gonna wanna do this. So at that moment, that's when I decided to create the Facebook group. Heck, man, since then, your Facebook page has blown up and your page is called I Run For Michael, right? It and it just keeps going. We hit 500 members within the first four months. Then all of a sudden, within the first year, we're at 17,000 members. And now we're at 40,000 members. We're, we're in 100 countries. We're all over the world. It's And it's it's people like, like me. It's people like you. It's people... It's, it's your everyday average person that's out there trying their best. I'm not breaking any land speed records. A lot of our members are not breaking any land speed records. That's fine. That's, that's exactly who we reach out to. And what we get out of it is we take ourselves out of that running and we put somebody else in it. So if I'm run, out running a 5K and the last mile is, is difficult, I think of Michael, I think of Michael sitting there and cheering me on. I can tell you that I have never had a DNF, which is a did not finish. I have never had a DNF running for Michael. I will crawl across a finish line so that I can, I can do that for Michael. It sounds like Michael had a pretty powerful effect on you. I bet you just had to meet this guy. I had been running for Michael for almost two years before I was finally able to fly out to San Diego to meet him. I've got goosebumps. I don't know if you can see it, but I've got goosebumps right now thinking about it. Um, I can only describe it as a kid on Christmas morning or his birthday morning or whatever. Like, Michael is such a hero to me that it was like, I, I remember pulling up to their their house. I remember getting out of the car. I remember knocking on the door going, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. I hope he likes me. I hope his mom and dad like me. Because we had never met before. We had chatted a few times. We had done this and that, but we had never, never met face to face. And it's like, oh my gosh, what, what if? And then that door opened and there was Mary, Al, and Michael, and all of my worries were washed away. I was greeted with hugs. And Michael, he's like, Big Tim, Big Tim, Big Tim. And I went over and I leaned over and I gave him a big hug. And he, he's he got this thing where he likes to kiss me on the side of the head. And that's the first thing that he did was he gave me a big hug and he kissed me. And I cried, I, I, I'll i admit, I, I try to be the manly man, but I, I was blubbering like a little baby uh, for a little bit. But then uh, the rest of our time there was absolutely amazing. It was, it was a lot of fun, it was, more than I could have ever dreamed of. So after all this, your Facebook group has just grown into so much more. I, this is cool, man. I actually saw you featured in Time Magazine. It's very surreal what has happened. We've got people getting tattoos. What? <laughs> I mean, seriously. Like, my logo is tattooed on other people. I've got an, I've got an amazing staff of volunteers. 
I'm just the guy that came up with the idea and, and started it. And I did this stuff in the beginning, but my volunteers, they're the ones that, that are doing all this. And our team has created this beautiful place for people to come and, and have it brighten their day. And all that from Michael sending you a Facebook comment. I was, I was in a bad place. I was going, I would just gone through a divorce. I was feeling sorry for myself and bang, there's Michael. He, he shows up at a time where I needed, where I needed him. I needed his, I needed his joy. I needed his light. None of this stuff would have happened if it weren't for the miracle of meeting Michael or him deciding to comment on my post saying, you can run for me anytime. That is a true miracle. Well, that's true. It's just a miracle because Michael is exactly what Timothy needed just to kind of get him out of his funk. Look what they created together. All right, Timothy, loved having you on the show. Thank you for your time. Your story is amazing. Thanks for having me. I'm a huge fan of the show. It goes to show you that one person can make a difference. So let's go to our next story. Whether it's dogs, cats, snakes, potbelly pigs, all of these animals, they have a will of their own. And sometimes that sentience leads them to run off. Which can also be terrifying for pet owners. Yeah, but new technology has allowed pet owners to reunite with their furry friends. And now we get the chance to meet the story of Cicely Thomas. She lost her dog Coltrane. The reunion took years. She crossed hundreds of miles, but technology helped to make it possible for her to find him. This is not your average story. This story is kind of epic. Cicely, thank you for joining us. Hi, Gunner. <laughs> it's so nice to speak with you today. It's nice to speak to you too. Let's start from the beginning. How did you come to adopt Coltrane? Uh, I had adopted Coltrane's older brother from someone in Lynchburg, Virginia. I bought his older brother as a gift for my nieces. I bought a house, and I had been in this house for like uh, a while, I think like two years or so, but I was never home. I was always traveling and everything, so I'm like, I bought a house, I should probably stay there sometimes, you know? <laughs> so I'll get a dog, you know, that'll help me stay home. So I had planned for about, about a year and a half, two years, I had kind of planned uh, to get a dog. I really wanted a dog, but I had to kind of structure my life so that I could, you know, be able to take care of him and drove down to Lynchburg to get Coltrane. <laughs> Very exciting. I've been asking for a family dog since I was seven. You have a dog. What happened once you finally got him? It was, it was kind of weird because uh, there was, this was my first dog. There were a lot of things he was doing. He was following me around all the time, everywhere, and chewing up all my stuff, you know? And I'm like, is this what dogs do, you know? <laughs> Didn't have any more personal space. Everywhere I went, Coltrane was there. I, don't, I had never, like, had um, anyone around me that I had to, like, pay attention to all the time. So he really helped me be more personable, you know, just be more, like, caring towards. So uh, after a while, we were inseparable. Okay, Cicely, now for the hard part. Walk us through what happened next. I was asked to come down to Southern Georgia to uh, support a contract there. And uh, my dad lives, has a home in uh, Jacksonville, Florida. So I was staying at my dad's house, me, Coltrane and myself were there. So um, there was this one instance I had to go back up to DC to meet with some clients. So I, I was gonna board him. I found a, a nice place to, you know, he could be boarded. But uh, there was someone here that was like, no, you know, bring him here, I'll watch him. So I was, I was hesitant, I was very hesitant, but I said, well, okay, you know, because other dogs are there, so he'll have someone to play with, you know. So I brought him down to Daytona from Jacksonville and left him there. And the next day, I get a phone call, like, Coltrane's missing. So, um, uh, I, I was just, I, I was devastated. I was really devastated. Got on a plane the next morning, came back down here to Daytona to, uh, to go look for him. And when you got there, you went to the apartment of the person who was supposedly watching Coltrane, and they didn't even answer the door. And at that time, I knew something was wrong. So, because um, the police was downstairs, and I'm like, what is the police doing here? And the police says, I'm here for you. For me, did you find out what happened after that? 
I didn't find out too much later exactly what happened. Actually, I didn't find out until after I got him back what happened. Um, someone comes over to the house and they see Coltrane and they're like, where did he come from? How did you get Coltrane back? You know, this person sold him. They sold him, they sold him. So, yeah, that was... <laughs> That was heartbreaking. <laughs> yeah, um, I would I would come down uh, because I have lots of friends and family here, you know. So I would just come down and I would uh, drive through the area where he went missing, and um, you know, every now and then someone would say, <laughs> uh, "I think I saw Coltrane," you know, and it's like, okay, like if you see if you saw him, like why didn't you try to get him for me, you know? And after years of searching and driving past the Humane Society every day, it must have felt a little hopeless. Yeah, so uh, 2013, going into 2014, yeah, I moved down here, right down the street from the Humane Society. So every day I drive by on my way home, you know, I have no choice. I see the Humane Society there, and I was thinking, I I'm going to adopt a dog. You know, one day I'm gonna stop at the Humane Society and I'm gonna find a dog because I think I'm ready now, you know? And sure enough, <laughs> you know, before I could go over there to do that, they called me like, hey, Miss Thomas, you know, we have a dog over here. We scanned him, a poodle type dog, and your name came up. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> And I'm thinking, like, this can't be, look, you know, I live five minutes away, you know. I said, um, what time do you all close? They're like, you know, five o'clock. It's like, like, 4.48 or something like that. So I'm like, I'll be right there. Please don't, co don't close. I'll be right there. Wow, it's incredible, right? I mean, after all these years, your dog Coltrane winds up right down the street. Miracle, right? Well, some miracles have an explanation. And to fill us in on this technology is Barry Kukas, the Community Outreach Director for the Halifax Humane Society in Daytona Beach, Florida. Barry, thanks for joining us, man. Hey, Kevin, my name's Barry. Uh, nice to meet you. Hey, nice to meet you too, Barry. Tell us about this microchip tracking. Now, some people think a microchip is a GPS device, and it's not. It just, we have people call us all the time say, hey, my dog ran off, can you turn on the GPS and let me know where they're at? That's not how it works. There's no tracking device. So all it is is strictly uh, for contact information. So we know it's identification. The process that's under the skin stays with the dog or cat, so it'll outlive any animal. Uh, and it, it's a great thing to have. It's very inexpensive. It runs somewhere between 16 to $20. So that's a pretty good return on investment for something that you know basically gives you some extra protection to know where your dog's at and gives your dog that opportunity to be found and returned to their home. They do get loose and they do get out and they get lost. Uh, it can be a bad situation. There's a lot of predators out there. You know, a smaller dog can get out, especially here in Florida. We have a lot of coyotes. Plus, you know, there's things called cars and trucks and vehicles that dogs aren't familiar with negotiating, especially if they're, they're domesticated. So they might just run out in the street because they see something and not even think about they're running in front of a car. They can fall into a lake, not be able to get out. There's all kinds of things. Hey, Barry, when Coltrane or any other lost dog, for that matter, comes into the Humane Society, what's their process? What do they go through? Uh, when a dog is lost, it comes into the shelter. It's put on a owner claim uh, for 72 hours, and giving the owners a chance to claim their animal for a 72-hour period. After that, if no one claims the animal, then they are behaviorally assessed and medically assessed. And if they pass both assessments, they're moved over to the adoption floor. I can imagine this was a hard stretch on Coltrane. Cicely, did they tell you about his demeanor when the Humane Society first took him in? I believe the Humane Society had him for maybe a week or so, and he was so aggressive, they couldn't scan him. You know, like my dog was missing for five years, and I got him back because he has the chip. That's the only reason why I got him back. Now tell us about this reunion. Look, guess who was found? Coltrane. So I get over there. And <laughs> they bring him out. <laughs> Coltrane. I'm like, oh my god. 
<laughs> Coltrane is like all matted and you know, and just like a, a, he comes out and I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, like that is him, you know. And Coltrane's looking at me like, where have you been? You know, he's like, you know how dogs like run up to you when they're trying to tell, get you to leave. They run to you and they run back, they run to you. So he was doing that to me. Like, let's get out of here, lady. Come on, come on, let's go. <laughs> I bet you two are closer than ever now. He just like sunk right back in, like nothing ever happened. And, and by that time, I'm like, okay, like, I have to get back into that mode of having a dog again, you know? But Coltrane was just like, I'm back, you know? Hey. Then also like, whenever I come home, I can leave the house for like two minutes. And I come back in the house, Coltrane is like, you know, you would think I was gone for years, you know? Cause he's just like, mommy, mommy, you know? <laughs> so um, uh, it's just been, it's just been, just wonderful. Just, you know, just wonderful. Barry, how does that make you feel, man? Okay, when we see people reunited with their pets, it's, it's an amazing feeling. We do a lot of things here at the Humane Society. You know, we have uh, adoptions, uh, we have training, we have behavioral assessments. But reuniting people with their animals, we do it about 10,000 times a year. Uh, the Halifax Humane Society is amazing. So I feel like the Humane Society really, really understands owners. You know, they, they understand uh, kind of what we need when we're away from our pets. They understand uh, what we need to take care of our pets. I don't know how they do it, you know? I, I, I really don't. And finally, what would you say to pet owners about microchipping? If you have a dog, get him chipped. That's it. If you have a dog, if you love your dog, if you want your dog, get him chipped. That's it. Thanks, Cicely. We got to talk to some pretty cool people. Yeah, and we have a lot more shows, but unfortunately, that's all the time we have today. You know what? You did pretty good. Maybe you can uh, co-host with me more often. Mm -hmm. We'll see. <laughs> Everyone, we appreciate your time. I'm Kevin Sizemore. And I'm Gunnar Sizemore. And this is The Miracle Show.